All right. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our third AES Standards webinar. I am Bruce Olson, Chair of the AES Standards Committee, and here is a short introduction to what the AES Standards Committee does. We are the meeting place for audio professionals. We have a number of professional areas, product designers, product manufacturers, system designers, content providers, and broadcast and presentation facilities. AES standards help to define operability between audio systems and components and support the businesses that use them. AES standards are respected throughout the audio community. The AES subcommittees are divided into four topic areas and an area for documents that are stable and are not expected to change. Uh, this webinar is going to be uh, talking a little bit about one of the working groups in SCO5, our subcommittee on interconnections. And I'd like to introduce you to Bill Whitlock. He is a founding member and past chair of the SCO505 working group, and they are developing some guidance for analog system interconnections. So go ahead, Bill. Okay, let me see if I can grab the screen. Pardon my cluttered office. Uh, let's get my share screen. Uh, where am I here? Okay, let me get into play mode. Okay. I, have I got the right screen up, I hope? That looks good, Bill. Okay. Um, this is, uh, as Bruce said, this is about work that's ongoing in, um, in uh, the working group at our, our, on Project X-152. So for all of you that care, uh, this is a bit about me. Um, you can... Go to this later if you want. It's kind of boring, but I've got a long history in the audio industry. Um, and when I was owner of Jensen Transformers, I started doing a lot of research into interfaces because that's where most transformers get used and uh, discovered some very interesting things, including a lot of widespread myths about interconnections and grounding and that whole subject. And they are all sort of related. And that's what my presentation today is going to start with. Um, so 152, uh, the specific project we're talking about today is a, it's ongoing work in a group and you'll see there at the bottom, uh, these are some of the members in the group. Um, we are grappling with some of the commonly encountered field issues and trying to establish something that manufacturers and data sheets can do about this basically. Um, uh, back in the 70s, where transformers were the standard interface, the nature of transformers means that they really didn't care what you were connecting to. You could even make transitions in a very straightforward way to uh, unbalanced gear. So this is a, a little uh, listing of what the problem is. The signals normally move through cables and interfaces, the little bits of electronics at each end of the cable that talks to the box and what's going on inside a given box in your system. Uh, but these days, because there's such a wide variety of ways to do balanced inputs and outputs, we have certain problems. And especially when we start trying to connect unbalanced gear. Uh, to bring in a signal or output a signal after some processing. But primarily our standards are concerned with analog interfaces and uh, balanced ones. Uh, so what we're proposing as a solution is to give manufacturers a format to, to put the specifications for input and output ports on their equipment so that if they disclose certain things, especially circuit topologies, the user has some way to predict what kind of problems he might have if he connects his gear together. So 
So this would apply to balanced analog audio, uh, but we are specifically leaving out things like computers. Uh, it's kind of a nightmarish issue. There are so many connectors and standards and levels and whatnot. And musical instruments, because things like guitar pickups are a very special case of a high impedance source. Uh, and it's, it kind of breaks all the rules about balanced interfaces. So we're leaving that part out. So I'm gonna do a quick run through of part of what's normally a longer presentation about interfaces in general. This is kind of highlights. Um, equipment manufacturers are very often truly ignorant, not, not in a pejorative way, but they just don't know the proper way to do interfaces. And sometimes a piece of equipment goes into production with things like pin one problems, uh, output stages that are a problem from the beginning. Uh, so it's a complicated issue uh, and there's enough ignorance to go around. Um, and I always love this, this little uh saying here about what do you do for a living i design and install yeah that's easy the gen general perception is that this is such an easy thing to do but in practice it's really not and ultimately physics rules you can't violate the laws of physics or you won't for very long even if you know you make exotic audio cables that cost a thousand dollars physics still works so here's our basic problem with interfaces and grounding. And this is sort of the, the umbrella under which uh, the interfacing SCO5 operates is this is the playground. We have ground voltages that occur when the equipment gets plugged into AC. Uh, as soon as we power it up, we've made inadvertently ground connections. And of course, never, ever, ever, ever disconnect that ground pin. The cheaters, all sorts of, I mean, that's an extremely dangerous shortcut solution, but it still gets done. So we have what's classically called a ground loop. If you follow this around, you will see that driven by a voltage that occurs in the wiring of the room or the building. Uh, and this has not been given a lot of attention until uh, I wrote a paper about it back in 2011 and showed how building wiring is the root cause of the voltage differences. And now these voltage differences occur across the ends of a signal cable, either appears on the receiving end as a common mode voltage or in the case of unbalanced interconnects causes a current to flow in the shield of the cable, which couples hum and buzz into the signal that's going through. Um, so in any case, this voltage is the stimulus for hum and buzz problems. So it's the framework. I mean, unless everything gets battery powered, we're, we're gonna have these issues and they're, they also affect digital systems to various degrees. So you have to understand how all this works if you're gonna have any prayer of ever solving problems. So Faraday's law of course applies. There, anytime current goes through a conductor, there's a magnetic field created that surrounds that conductor. Anytime a wire is exposed to this fluctuating magnetic field, Faraday's law says that a voltage will be induced across the length of that wire that's exposed to the field. And since we have two current carrying wires inside the wiring of our buildings, and we have a safety ground wire that sits right in there next to them, this happens all the time in wiring. Uh, Romex, for example, if we were to slice a piece of Romex, and we had currents flowing into and out of the screen. Let me get my pointer on again. So we could have current coming out of the screen on this conductor and into the screen here. So the direction of the magnetic fields is indicated by the arrows with the north and south poles of the magnets. 
and the fields of course spread because like fields, if you consider these two little bar magnets, repel each other and they push the magnetic fields away and there's actually a physical force between these two conductors trying to move them apart. But if we put a third wire right smack in the middle, it's gonna feel zero magnetic field. And this is kind of a happy accident with Romex or you know, a, the sheathed three conductor uh, that's so common in household wiring. But in commercial buildings, things are way different. Electricians simply pull three conductors into conduit. We lose control over the physical positioning of what's next to what and where the magnetic fields are. And all of a sudden we have relatively large voltage differences running here between two outlets, the voltage being produced by this parasitic transformer. So we have established this common mode voltage or voltage difference, GVDs as I like to talk about them, uh, between two boxes. And of course this complicates everything that goes on in a simple cable that interconnects the two pieces and puts requirements and stresses on the line driver and especially the line receiver to reject the effects of this voltage difference. So this is what interfaces have to do. Uh, so this is a magnetically induced, the voltage induced, if we go back to Faraday's law, is proportional to the, how fast the current changes or how rapidly the magnetic field changes. So we have what we call DIDT, uh, change, a rapidly changing current produces a lot more voltage, the bottom line. And that's why light dimmers are so notoriously awful at creating hums and buzzes and systems. And if you wanna delve into this deeper, you can uh, look for some of the seminars I've done at AES or um, elsewhere. I, I preach everywhere I can about this kind of stuff. So here is a, a little snip from the paper I did in 2011 that compares uh, configurations of wiring. Uh, this is the familiar Romex that's used residentially. Uh, these are some worst case scenarios of positioning these wires randomly. This is a commercial type uh, that electricians can use, but the best solution of all magically comes from simply twisting the black and the white wires before they're pulled into the conduit and leaving the green wire out of the twist as the best performance of all, some thousand times better than a worst case, 60 dB of noise reduction. Powerful, powerful stuff, but it's been overlooked for decades. So we're left with a fact of life that between two outlets, there will be a voltage difference between the ground connections on these two outlets, even if they're only 10 feet apart and on the same branch circuit, there'll be a small voltage there. Or even if the power cords don't have a third prong, there are leakage currents that are due to the presence of voltages inside the equipment. And we'll have a slide, I think, coming up on that. So the signal interfaces are the victim. Um, and there are two very generic basic kinds of signal interfaces. There's the balanced, which has two signal conductors, just like an unbalanced connection. But in the unbalanced connection, the difference is that one of those two conductors is grounded at both ends. This means that the voltage difference between the two boxes that we have to, comes from just plugging things in now appears directly across the length of this grounded conductor. And because the voltage received over here is the sum total of the, whoops, Oh, got ahead of myself here. Well, there's actually a better slide. Um, this is the, uh, just to show that how widespread unbalanced interfaces are even in very expensive gear. But 
the, the inherent problem with unbalanced interconnections is that that ground voltage difference that's between the boxes flows through the ground part or the ground conductor, whatever it is, whether it's a wire or a shield or some exotic combination of the two, this conductor has resistance. And when a current flows through it, of course, there's a small voltage drop created from point A to point B, just by the noise current flow. So the signal seen at this end is now the sum of the voltage that we want, the signal from the other box, but like two batteries in series, the noise gets added to it. So what we see here is noise plus signal coming back. And that's the basic problem. And the resistance of this conductor, which nobody talks about in marketing, which I've never understood, uh, when it comes to noise, this is the most important property of an unbalanced interface cable. But nobody ever talks about it. In fact, you have to really dig to find out what this resistance is. Very strange. So this is a worked example of, of a system that has a small leakage current, two prong plugs on both pieces of gear. Uh, so you'd think there couldn't be a ground loop, but this is, I sometimes call it the invisible ground loop. It's caused by small leakage currents that UL allows and are normal, unavoidable actually, in gear. Leakage currents that flow between the power line connection and the chassis of this gear. So in the case of a CD player, uh, if we use an inexpensive cable that has an end-to-end -end shield resistance of one ohm, we get a noise that is uh, like minus 60 dB. I can't see this side of my screen. Um, and if we replace that with a cable that has the same length but has heavy copper in its shield, uh, like Belden's, they call it a video cable, but I think it's a really nice audio cable. We can make a 24 dB improvement just by replacing the cable. Now, the balanced interface, which is well, presumably professional and balanced, belong together. Uh, unbalanced to a purist has no place in a, in a professional world uh, simply because it has so many built in problems. But I found out early on when I started researching all this back in 94, 93, shortly after I took over Jensen Transformers, that balanced interfaces are extremely widely misunderstood. In fact, this definition of a balanced interface is one that I found online. And since I've found this even in textbooks, otherwise respectable textbooks, that will define a balanced interface in terms of equal but opposite voltage swings on the conductors. And I'm here to tell you that that is absolutely wrong. It has nothing to do with where the signal voltages are. We use balanced interfaces because they have noise rejection properties that are extremely powerful and they have nothing whatsoever to do with signals. In fact, intuitively, how do we test a system for noise? The very first thing we do is take the signal away and turn up the gain and listen for the noise. Well, if the presence of the signal on one or the other of those wires had anything to do with it, why would we remove the signal in the first place? So this completely misses the point about balanced interfaces. It is all about impedances and only impedances. Now, Henry Ott is uh, somebody that is on the technical staff of AT&T, and he knows a thing or two about balanced interfaces because the phone companies were the first widespread users of balanced circuits. And they had gargantuan noise problems to solve. Outdoor wires very often running next to power lines, et cetera, et cetera. So what makes a balanced interface work is the equal impedances. And this was so important that with the help of John Woodgate back in 1999, we helped the IEC who recognized that their test for common mode rejection was not working, had no relation to results in the real world. And they put out a uh, call for comments. 
And I felt like the kid in the back of the room and raised my hand and said, hey, I know, I know, I know what's wrong with your test and proposed a new one. But there were objections. There were people that were really tied into this idea of equal and opposite swings and they objected to this test uh, because it, it didn't rely on any of that. So we put an informative annex in that IEC standard when it was published to explain that the noise rejection comes from the impedance balance of this system. And it has nothing to do with the signal. The only thing the signal can affect is crosstalk and of course headroom. If you swing a signal on both lines, you get twice as much signal differentially. So it's a very important thing to, to know. So if we do a elementary diagram of a balanced interface, we have two signal lines and neither one is grounded. That makes it not an unbalanced system. And what we try to do is make the impedance of this line with respect to a third point, usually ground is our reference, make the impedance to ground the same between this line and this one. And we variously call these, in fact, this is one of the things the committee uh, working group is grappling with is terminology. We can call this hot, cold, plus, minus, high, low, and there's a variety of names, but whatever the name, it's a pair. And we send our signal as a difference between these two. And the receiver, most important duty is to ignore anything, any voltage that's the same on both of these pins. And because it's the same, we call it common, as in the same, common mode voltage is one that's the same here. And our signal is the difference between the two. So a differential receiver or a balanced line receiver, number one duty is to ignore common mode voltages and respond only to the differential voltage. And of course, transformers can do that and a variety of electronic things can do that. So common mode rejection ratio is a way to test how much is the response to the differential signal compared to the common mode signal? Ideally, we'd have no response to common mode. So the ratio or the common mode rejection ratio, CMRR, would be a huge number. Would be, you know, 80, 90 or more dB bigger than its response to common mode. So it's a ratio, so it has no units of voltage or level. It's simply a ratio expressed in dB, period. It's always a positive number for any useful receiver. And a large number means better noise rejection. But I see in print a lot people that put, you know, minus 90 dBU, uh, which is just all wrong. That indicates a signal level, not a ratio, and it's a negative number, and it's supposed to be positive, et cetera, et cetera. This is my license plate, by the way. Uh, I take this very seriously. So this is usually the aha moment for people understanding a balanced interface. If you look at this, you'll see the familiar look of a Wheatstone bridge. And here we have noise, the, the voltage between these two grounds at, at box A, the signal source, box B, the signal receiver, and it has a balanced input. This has a balanced output. This is our cable in between the two. So this voltage now appears through the common mode output impedances of this box and appears as common mode voltages into the common mode impedances of the receiver. And there's some very interesting properties to this bridge. First of all, you're probably aware that it takes some extremely tight matching of the ratios of these two resistances to achieve high rejection. In other words, I've got two voltage dividers here, and if I get them matched to within 0.001%, then no matter what this voltage is, there'll be no difference between these two because the ratios are the same. But if I start 
putting a tolerance or fiddling the values of these, what I find is that if all four of these have the same impedance, I am maximally sensitive. A little variation in one of these will really upset the bridge. But it seems obvious if you think about the extremes, if these impedances were zero, there couldn't ever be a voltage difference between here because they'd have a short circuit up here. So it wouldn't matter what these were. The common, the voltages here would always be identical. On the other hand, if I were somehow able to make these impedances infinite, an open circuit, then these voltages would be the same regardless of what was happening over here. And in the real world, these are the impedances that we have not such tight control over. But these, we can do something about. And this gets around to the test procedure. The, a common test in the past has been to simply short these two together and drive them with the same voltage and call that common mode rejection ratio. Well, that would never work in a system because in a system, the source isn't a short circuit. It's a real box that has real impedances that have variations and tolerances on these impedances. And that's where the IEC testing spec, the new one came from. It assumes that if I put a 10 ohm imbalance in one side, then I should look at the common mode as a result of that. That is a much better indicator of what's gonna happen in the real world because common mode rejection ratio requires a system, whether it's on a test bench where this is a signal generator or it's out in the real world where the signal source is a real piece of gear. So we've been kicking this around in the standards committee as well, uh, trying to get everybody on the same page regarding how a balanced interface works, what's important, what should be specified about these, um, test conditions especially. Uh, it is very, very misleading to simply say the input has a common mode rejection ratio of 90 dB, period. Well, what were the test conditions? If it was with a short circuit, it's practically a meaningless number because there's no source of any kind specified. Now you can specify it with a perfectly balanced source if you want to, but that's not very meaningful either because real world equipment is not perfect. So the IEC test is a proper way to do it, but it, you need to tell the person who's looking at this data sheet how you've done this. You know, it's a little like the old this frequency response of the system is 20, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz with no limits, no test conditions. It's meaningless without knowing how it was done. And that's what standards should address. So in the end, we have marketing common mode rejection and real common mode rejection. So this is the new test um, that's in IEC standard 60268-3, uh, was adopted back in 2000 and still is the standard way to measure common mode. So this is the, this is the old test, which literally tweaked a laboratory signal generator until it was perfect. And actually it was a clever way to test if it was perfect. You flip this switch back and forth until you got no difference in the meter reading. It assured that this was a absolutely perfectly matched source impedance. But the number you got was valid only with that perfect signal source. So the new test involves switching a 10 ohm imbalance first in one side and then in the other uh, you need to do that just to keep people from tweaking this so it works with 10 ohms here, but not here. Uh, and you take the worst of those numbers and that's what you can expect as a real world common mode rejection. So then there's the pin one problem. And uh, we've talked about this since Neil Muncy did his uh, first paper back in 1994 uh, and actually dubbed it the pin one problem the late Neil Muncy, he died in 2012, unfortunately. Um, but it's common, common impedance coupling, much like an unbalanced uh, interface where noise currents flow through a resistance in the box. So basically the pin one problem occurs when you allow 
external currents that will flow. Remember these voltage voltages that are generated in our ground system. If they flow through the cable shield, which they will if you ground a balanced cable at both ends, which is customary, we now have set up a pathway for this voltage to cause a current to flow through the boxes, through the cable, and to get back where it wants to go, which is the other prong on the uh, other equipment. But if we allow that current to flow through even some PC board traces inside our signal pathway in the box, we will create tiny voltage drops here that will get injected right into the circuitry. So we'll have noise in our output and the same at the receive end. So to avoid pin one problems, we make connections between the XLR and the box in a way that gives that noise current a separate pathway. If it's a non-metallic housing, a separate wire that goes right to where the green wire on the power cord is. So that current never flows through any of our signal pathways or grounds. Or if we have a metal chassis, the first thing you wanna do is land pin one directly to the metal box and allow the current to flow through the box and not our internal ground reference circuitry. Now, this is a technique called hybrid grounding, which for various reasons uh, that I won't go into here, there are reasons never to allow any noisy currents to flow on this shield because it can couple noise into the inner conductors. But on the other hand, if we leave one end of the shield disconnected, we are opening up the cable to be a radio antenna. And this is especially severe if you're near an AM radio transmitter or something. So there's a technique called hybrid grounding where you use a capacitor at this end. So, the, so the, this end of the cable looks grounded at radio frequencies, but looks open at audio frequencies. So it's like getting the best of both worlds. We don't get the degradations caused by grounding the shield at both ends for power line frequencies, but we get it for RF frequencies. And this, this got turned into a product by Neutrik some years back called the EMC connector, where these capacitors are built right into the shell of the, of the plug. Highly recommended, especially if uh, RF interference is a big problem. So <clears throat> this is a big issue um, that's currently under discussion in the group. Uh, and that's making transitions between unbalanced interfaces and balanced ones to feed into our pro systems. In other words, if somebody's got a CD player that's a consumer player uh, and they wanna hear it through the monitor speakers. So you try to rig some interface to get the signal from the CD player into a balanced input on your board. How do you do that? Well, if you're feeding, this would, there are boxes out and various solutions to do this consumer to pro conversion. Well, if, well the first thing we notice is that the signal levels are different. Reference level in a professional world is plus four dBU, which works out to 1.223 volts roughly. In the consumer world, minus 10 dBV or 316 millivolts RMS is a common reference level. Now these are not maximum levels, these are reference levels. So we'll see that the difference is about 12 dB or four to one. So we can use a step up transformer uh, to raise the level and that's fraught with its own problems. Uh, ratios and transformers and whatnot. But in most cases, the board, the pro gear that we're working with has enough re gain reach to make up for that 12 dB. So we don't have too much trouble on the input side. But there is a good and bad way to do this. There are adapters like this, and I kind of boo and hiss every time I 
go near a booth for people that sell this because it encourages people to do everything the wrong way. So this is the wrong way to do it, is to put an adapter at your balanced input. Because now we're right back in the soup that we have with an ordinary RCA cable. We have a two conductor cable that's grounded at both ends. So we're gonna have ground currents of noise flowing through the shield of this cable. And the voltage that appears on pin two at our XLR is gonna be just like in the RCA cable case, the sum of the signal we want and the noise that we don't. But we can fix this problem by simply treating this signal as balanced all the way to the consumer device. And there and only there do we join low and shield. So now the ground noisy ground current has its own pathway through the shield between boxes and our differential input, which is gonna to respond only to the voltage difference between these two pins is now remotely looking at the difference between these two pins and has no noise currents flowing through the low side. So it's a very simple fix and it'll make at least 30 dB of difference in the noise. So here's a hint for the day that you can take to the studio. It works and it works well. But what about going the other way? Now we have a level problem in the reverse issue because now if we're gonna have any, any meaningful indication on our VU meters in the, on the pro side, we're gonna be putting out plus four, which is four times as big a signal as the consumer device is expecting. So we'll overdrive it or we can turn down our output, but then our VU meters won't hardly move. So signal difference is a legit concern. And of course we can put a pad in but now we have, again, no ground isolation. So we, we may have loops depending on how we're doing it. But even worse, variations in modern balanced output stages make this really risky business on how to tie these two together. Because one side of our balanced output presumably would be grounded and the other be the high side. And there are some outputs you can ground, some that you must ground, and others that you don't dare ground them. So here is schematically represented uh, one of the issues that we're dealing with right now. Ignoring the blue parts here, a ground reference symmetrical, and these are kind of working names. We're not sure how we're going to specify these or recommend that manufacturers refer to them in some uh, uniform way. For instance, this one goes under all sorts of names, uh, servo balanced outputs or electronically balanced or just a, a whole raft of names. But the oldest and most common in older gear balanced output is simply two voltage sources. One drives a signal, you know, plus and minus, and the other one drives it minus and plus, the familiar symmetrical voltage drive output, two sine waves. Now this one, if you ground one, the low side, this amplifier is gonna get very upset. Uh, it'll overheat, it'll current limit, go into distortion. It might even release the factory install smoke in one of these drivers if you ground this output. So that's, that's a case where you can't ground and output. Now there's a recent variation on this, which I highly recommend for compatibility reasons, because we know that you do not need these equal and opposite signal swings. Why not put all the signal up here, but keep our impedance matched or balanced output because balance is defined by these two impedances. And because the output of an op amp under feedback is zero impedance, because it's a stiff voltage source, we can substitute by just grounding this resistor. There's no signal here. All the signal is here, but the impedances are perfectly matched as well as these resistors are matched. And we get rid of this op amp and its associated parts and just do a ground here. 
So this is a ground reference high only drive, a balanced output, but it only drives the high line. And here you can ground the low side of this output with no problem whatsoever. So plugging this into anything, whether it's a balanced input or an unbalanced input is no problem. Now we have what's probably more popular today is the servo balanced or cross coupled, uh, the SSM 2142, I think it is, um, uh, and its successors, including a, a new one that's got a patented uh, uh, way of dealing with uh, clipping by that corporation. They make a, a rather superior version of this. But this one tries to imitate a transformer and does a pretty fair job in that you can, you can see a balanced output. It has differential signals on both pins. But if you ground one, the signal over here gets twice as big by virtue of this combination of positive and negative feedback. And these sometimes called the straight jacket configuration. But, um, and it does a pretty fair job of imitating a transformer. It has low differential output impedance, relatively high common mode output impedances, which is important to the balance of the bridge. Uh, so it's, it performs almost as well as a transformer. In some cases, can be even better. But here, because this does float, there is no low impedance with respect to ground on this end. We need to ground the non-signal output of this. So if we're taking the signal from the high side, this needs to go to ground. And theoretically, to get rid of the ground voltage differences, this should be grounded at the other end of the cable, right at the unbalanced load over here. But there are some stabilities in older versions of this chip that, that make that a little dicey. So then we have the ubiquitous transformer, which doesn't care what it's connected to because it truly and literally electrically floats. It's like a battery. Its two terminals have no voltage with respect to ground. It simply doesn't reference it. There's only a difference voltage from one end to the other, a true floating source. But in this case, you must ground this side if you're gonna use this as an unbalanced high output. People have found out the hard way that if you connect only to here and ground, you're going to get a very tinny sounding signal because you're going to be seeing the signal through the unintended capacitances between primary and secondary. The transformer will be acting like a capacitor instead of a, an inductor. So this is uh, uh, these output stages connected to a balanced input. And this is the electrical equivalent for circuit modeling purposes. So I'd throw that in for modeling fans. Unfortunately, the, the problems with doing this kind of inter interface in particular are caused by the manufacturer not telling you what he's done in his output stage. And this is unfortunately the rule rather than, than the exception. Uh, the data sheet will tell you it has a balanced output, but not a clue about what kind it is or what its uh, peculiarities might be if you start connecting it into a system. Now, I did find an exception. I was looking all over the web. This is a data sheet for Altec Lansing. I forget what it's called now, speaker mate or something, but it's a, a, a processor to go in front of a loudspeaker. But here they actually talk about the input topology. You'd have to look up to see what a super bal is. It's a variation on a differential amplifier. But more important, this is an electronically balanced, modified cross coupled da da da, uh, number two in our list. The cross coupled servo balanced goes by so many names, including this one. Uh, but this is really rare. And what we're trying to do is to get manufacturers to, to put a standardized description of topology. So then a simple compatibility table can be made to, to predict the problems that you may have connecting one piece to another.
And the only method that always works, like we showed previously, is a transformer, and there are transformer boxes to accomplish this task. So the Audio Engineering Society, of course, as Bruce said, has a number of committees. It tries to make our life more reasonable and less frustrating by having some standards so we know what to expect when we put equipment together. Um, and there are lots of violations of standards out there. Uh, IEC, for example, has standards about input and output impedances. And you'll often find inputs that are at 2K ohms, even though IEC for a consumer input says the minimum is 22K. Um, so when you plug equipment into that, uh, probably the worst that'll happen was because of coupling capacitors, the low end response will, will get really bad. So that's kind of the end of my presentation. So I, how do we set up for questions here? Oh, we did have one question earlier, Bill, that is, is there something, um, is, is there too high an input impedance when you're talking about the, um, the Wheatstone Bridge and you talked about um, having a very low output impedance and a very high input impedance, uh, both of those uh, serving to solve um, the balance equation. So the question is, is there too high an input impedance down on the receive side? Okay, well, we have to differentiate when, we, when it comes to balanced inputs and outputs. Remember, we talked about common mode impedances, which are important for the noise rejection. But normally in data sheets, when a piece of equipment is specified for input impedance or output impedance, we're talking about the differential impedance across the lines. Now, IEC says that, that uh, uh, pro gear should have a total output differential impedance. In this case, uh, it would be the sum of these two. Um, but the differential output impedance should be no higher than a thousand ohms. Oh, sorry about my buttons here. But uh, most gear, it's much lower than that. And on the other hand, IEC says that input impedances differentially should be no lower than 10K ohms. But the common mode impedances, no, they cannot be too high. Higher is always better here. Infinite would be preferred. And in fact, a transformer, in a transformer, these impedances are simply parasitic capacitances. And at audio frequencies, these impedances are up in the millions of ohms. And the ingenious IC from that corporation also imitates this behavior by bootstrapping resistors to make them appear to be 10 or 20 million ohms. And this is what gives them very high common mode in the real world. So when we talk about impedances and balance lines, usually we're talking about differential impedance, the impedance from the two sides of the input to each other and not with respect to ground. If we talk about impedances with respect to ground, those are common mode impedances. So yes, these, these can never be too low, for practical reasons, they seldom dip below 40 or 50 ohms. Uh, but, and these are, can't be too high either. These could be meg ohms too, differentially, but you sort of are leaving yourself open to uh, capacitive coupling through the air from voltage sources. So generally you don't see inputs much over about 100K differentially. But common mode, yes, they can get extremely high uh, and are preferable, actually. So I hope that answered that question. Yeah. So to summarize, the common mode impedance can't be too high. No. But the differential mode um, has got a whole series of engineering compromises associated with it. Right. It's, you know, like... Uh, you're really putting an antenna in the air. If there's any exposure, even the pins at the XL connector can start picking up noises 
if the impedances are high enough. Um, you'd have to shield everything very well along the way. It kind of takes you back into the tube days. That's why shielding was so important back in the tube era, because input impedances were very often, uh, the differential mode was very often a megaohm or more, and output impedances were in the 10,000 ohm area. Uh, so it was a high impedance world in the days of vacuum tubes, generally. But we also didn't have cell phones, so that made it a little bit easier. It's <laughs> true. Yeah, the world was a little more tame back then for EMI. So we, um, uh, we've got two questions from one gentleman. One is, can the slides be shared? Are you going to share those through your normal mechanism? Uh, yes, I can post them with AES, or uh, you can write me, send me an email directly, and I'll send you the pack uh, in a PDF form. Okay, it's great. Cool. So it's got my... My email is right there. But and I'll, then, uh, where where would they be shared on the AES? Uh, is there a? I'm not sure about common that. place for posting. Well, you can always get me at this email address. Um, I don't have a website up yet, or I'd put it there. Um, okay. Um, can you point to a document that shows the twisting? of the power line conductor is, ex is acceptable. So th that's what your paper from 2000, um, 2011, yes. 2011 talks okay. about. So that's available in the AESE library. Right, that's called uh, Ground Loops, the rest of the story. Um, and this has been done several times. The Bing Auditorium at Stanford University, for example, was wired with twisted and they were just, their jaws dropped when they first turned on the entire audio system. There wasn't a hum or a buzz anywhere to be had, uh, which is pretty amazing if you've ever commissioned a large sound system. Um, and we're doing it for some other people as well, or at least I'm supervising the install for a, a very well-known name that I can't name. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been done. And my, my colleague, Jamie Fox, uh, the two of us wrote the paper. Uh, he is a power line engineer or power engineer, I guess more properly. So we collaborated in writing this 2011 paper. And since he was right out of college, I let him do all the heavy lifting with the math. And I did the uh, laboratory experiments and, and gathered all the data. And fortunately, theory and data agreed within a few percent. So it was a great success in proving that that works. But there is, to, to get to the other question that sometimes comes up, there is no prohibition in code against doing that. Uh, right. As long as you respect the number of conductors in a conduit, you know, the thermal considerations and loading, you're, you're cool. Okay, well, uh, we've got... One other question. Um, you didn't really talk about the ground lift switches that we find in some equipment. Uh, yeah. And um, so uh, qu the question is, can you talk a little bit more about that? And I think this will probably be our last question before the end of the hour here. Okay. Uh, yeah. For the sake of time, I didn't go into shields and their connections, but as I when I talked about the hybrid connection at the receive end, uh, the general rule is, and I've written about this in other papers, and if you look on the internet, you can find, uh, well, the Indiana AES section, for example, has posted a complete seminar that I did there, and it talks about this. And it's also in some of the um, uh, papers that I've done for AES over the years at conventions. But to summarize, uh, Theoretically, a shield should not be a current carrying conductor. If you look in textbooks, uh, the, it should never be allowed to conduct current. It's a shield. It has one ground connection. So in the, in the world of audio cables, if you're going to lift one end, which is sometimes helpful, it should always be the receive end. For reasons that I explain in some of these more detailed seminars, there are two good bulletproof reasons to never lift the shield at the send end of a cable at the signal source. 
because there are currents in the shield uh, that need that want to get right back to the driver. The capacitively coupled currents from the signal pair to the shield want to come back to the driver. If if the shield is landed at the receive end, those currents will find their way back and they'll find it through some very devious paths. And I've seen entire consoles go into oscillation when this was their standard practice. Uh, so always ground the send end. You may or may not put a lift at the receive end. That's the, the general rule. And, the, and I don't just have opinions about that. I have facts to back me up. So when I get into arguments like that, I always win. Um, so that, that is the rule. Um, and I know it's broken. I've seen lots of gear with lift switches at the output side. Um, but beware, you may have some bigger issues if you do that. Okay. Um, Rich um, mentioned, uh, given the large difference in reference levels between consumer and professional interfaces, um, going from that balanced output to an unbalanced consumer input, we talked about that we probably need a pad, um, and this pad should probably be located at that input rather than at the output yes. um, in order to ensure minimum noise. noise. Right. Keep the line and, at its lowest impedance on the way. Right. And then the right way to implement this pad, which... Or a, uh, or a four to one step down transformer will do the job as well. Provide isolation and a drop in level. And again, you'd want to do that at the receive and yes. not at the send end. Right. Yeah. You always want the longest cable on the on, attached to the lowest impedance source that's driving the cable. So... You know, output cables should be long, input cables should be short. Okay. So I think we're at the end of the hour here. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. If you're interested in participating in this standard or any of the other standards that we're working on, you can go to the AES website, click on standards, um, and you'll find a topic there for standards development, and that gives you information on how to join any of the working groups, uh, including this one. Um, we're really pleased that everybody uh, came. Thank you, Bill, for uh, once again another great presentation. And we'll see you in a couple of months for the next webinar. All right. Thank you all. Stay healthy out there. Thank you.